before we get into this episode, there's something that might be of interest that I wanted to tell you about. Seen and Heard, who uh, run this podcast, have been asked by Scotland Food and Drink to undertake a strategic review of the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards. Now, these Excellence Awards have been going for almost 20 years and are a huge mainstay of the food and drink sector. But it's time to ensure that they're still relevant. So if you have ever been involved in the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards, or even if you've ever had an opinion about them, we would love for you, please, to complete our survey. So if you go to the On Farm Twitter, which is at on underscore farm uk and click the link in the bio there will be a tab in there that will take you to the survey and it should only take you a very short while to complete but we would be enormously grateful hello and welcome to on farm i'm anna davis and this time we return to scottish agri co-op umbrella organization saos This is the second part of their series focusing on how working together cooperatively has to be a big part of Scottish farming's response to the issues around climate change. When we last spoke about this with SAOS, it was a broad overview of the industry's climate change challenges. Do go back and find that episode. It'll be beneath this one in your podcast feed. A quick round of thank yous before we start, though. Um, As always, we like to thank people who've spotted and shared our episodes or talked about us on social media just to make sure uh, they get the thanks that they deserve. So to make sure you get your own tip of the hat, tag us in your tweets and posts so that we can see it and make a note. So thanks this time go to uh, David Thompson, uh, Royal Highland Education Trust, Derek Stewart, NFU Scotland Social Account, SOPA uh, and Grierson Organic. Thanks as well to the Stories of Scotland podcast for recommending us to their listeners. If you're interested in Scottish history and folk tales, please do look them up. Thank you to everyone who shares, not just the people we mention, we can't mention you all, but thank you to everyone who shares and talks about our episodes both on social media and off social media. It means the world to us and we really need your help to keep the message out there. So please keep going. On we go with the episode then. The subject is, as I said, climate change and the farming supply chain. We've got a great bunch of guests, all connected with SAOS and all involved in the co-op sector. And you'll hear them introduce themselves next. Robert Logan, project manager at SAOS, working with various co-ops around the country. Increasingly and and recently, that has been uh, around climate change and tackling the climate emergency. So yeah, Gary Cato. I um, work for a company called Highland Grain Limited. We're a malting barley cooperative based in the Highlands of Scotland, covering 90 members and handling a throughput of about 40,000 tonnes of malting barley, which we then handle, dry, store and sell to our maltsters and distiller friends. I've been in the job for two and a half years, or three harvests, as it's counted in this trade, it's, it's a busy old business. Andy McGowan, I'm the Managing Director of Scottish Pig Producers. We're a cooperative of 76 farmers in Scotland and Northern Ireland. We, the main purpose is to market those pigs to the various processors around, around the UK. We, uh, we sell about 500,000 pigs a year. So we, we make up a reasonable chunk of the supply chain in both, in both countries. The key thing is our board has always taken a view that it's not just about selling the pigs, it's about creating the best long-term environment for rearing pigs profitably. And I suppose that's got to be one of the key things, really, when we talk about climate change. You know, you hear all the time, really nothing can be done about climate change unless a business is profitable and has the money to invest. Robert, so I understand that on behalf of SAOS, you've been leading on a bit of research and survey work. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Why have you been doing it and what kind of responses have, have you had? Yeah. Thanks, Anna. No, the, if you step back and look at the, the, the global challenge, which is, seems, you know, any one person thinking about that level of challenge, you, you, just, you just can't get your head around it. One good thing has been that the Scottish Government have brought that into sharper focus for us by setting ambitious targets to, to become net zero by 2045. Agriculture has got, you know, as, as every industry does, has got a massive part to play in delivering that commitment. And hopefully a more prosperous sector, ultimately, that's the ultimate goal. So we can deliver both economic and environmental gains from this. Now, the hard bit is, is not in 
appreciating the principles, but actually doing something about it. We're taking the stance that this, the whole climate emergency, massive piece that it is, is too great a challenge for any uh, wind farm business to be able to tackle by themselves. And we need effective solutions which are going to come from people getting together and working cooperatively. And we deal with farmers' challenges day to day. We're doing it through the structure of Scottish agricultural co-ops. And we see them, they're raison d'etre, basically, as, as is SOSs, is to drive value, whatever form that takes, to farmers and the industry. We see climate challenge is not something to be shirked. It's such a big challenge. We need to see the opportunities within that. So it must have been a fairly a big task and not necessarily an easy one. What were some of the specifics of what you were really trying to, to get from members in terms of, of understanding more deeply what, what their their views and indeed activities were? So, yeah, I mean, the co-ops cover a, mass, you know, a wide range. It covers every sector in Scottish agriculture which is fantastic, but equally that makes it really difficult to find one answer. There is no one answer. Initially, we're wanting to find out what, what do we know about the challenge in respect to what Scottish agriculture can do about it? What's our starting point within each each individual co-op? So yeah, it was a, it was a survey that we pulled the results and, 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 and looked at them collectively. But at the same time, we're getting, wanting to get a feel from the individuals of where they're at. And I suppose a bit of attitudes as well, making sure you know, how positive are we about the, the challenge ahead? Do we just see it as a challenge or can we start to see opportunities? The responses were really good, really, really good. You know, where, where the efficiencies lie and what impact they can have as a business. But one thing did keep percolating to the top, which was useful. They know they need to do something and want to do something, but just knowing where to start, what the priorities are and things. It lets us know that we're on the right track with the rest of the co-ops and the Climate Challenge project. As I said before, we're now currently in the second uh, episode of a series that we're doing with SAOS. And we're now wanting to delve a little bit into supply chains. So perhaps for the uninitiated, Gary, could you tell us a little bit more about how Highland Grain and your members fit into to the supply chain? Yeah, sure. We sort of fit in between the, the, the farmer and the maltster. What we do is offer security and comfort to the members so they're not overly exposed to the market. A bit of a safety net, really. So we'll guarantee to handle our members' barley, even in bad seasons. We have our own lab on site, so we do our own testing to find out the quality of the barley. I know it probably sounds a little bit cheesy, but it's a big family. You know, a lot of members have been members for a very long time. Highland Grain's been been on the go since the late 1970s and has grown from a throughput of 4,000 tonne up to 40,000 tonne. So we take the the malting barley in from the member, we test it, we dry it, we store it, and we market it, and hopefully add value to that barley. Uh, Not necessarily just a monetary value, but also a sort of security value as well. It might be quite useful to understand, first of all, what, what demands are on your shoulders when it comes to climate change responsibility, and where some of those demands are coming from. How how high they start and how they filter down to to become your responsibility. Could you give us a bit of an outline of some of those? Yeah, sure. So as a group, as a cooperative, it's something that we do discuss at board level, quite commonly, actually. Uh, And I think that awareness is starting to spread throughout the farming fraternity, especially with the news, you know, the, the carbon neutral 2045 Scotland thing. I think everybody's more aware of it now. I think as a sector, we've been maybe take a slightly different approach to it in that we haven't been subsidised for several decades. So it's really been a case of survival of the fittest, which meant we've had a very firm focus on efficiency improvement. And as a co-op, we, one of the first points on this one is back in 2002 when we set up a separate company to uh, drive health improvement, uh, health being the biggest constraint on efficiency within the uh, p- you know pig farms achieving their potential. So we recognised from way back then that we could drive efficiency better by working nationally and regionally rather than individual farms just doing their own thing. As an output of that has been farms that are more profitable, have lower costs of production and are more efficient. But the more efficient farms have a lower carbon footprint. We just weren't measuring it in those terms. So we have a sector that's already well used to working collectively to try and push these things down because we've won that argument that says it's in their interest 
to get involved with these things because they will be more profitable. It's just that in the last couple of years and going forward, we'll be needing to measure this more explicitly in terms of carbon and environment, whereas previously I would have measured it in terms of growth rates and health. But it has the same impact. We have an Aberdeen benchmarking group and their output from the breeding herd has increased by 30% in 10 years. That's average farms just doing all the little bits of it better and the cumulative impact of that. Now, I'm interested now in trying to drill back into that data. My suspicion would be that's reduced the carbon footprint per kilo of Scottish port by about 15, 16%. Wow. So whilst it was always intentional, these efficiency changes, obviously, and profit-driven and output-driven, the knock-on benefit has been that actually these efficiencies have led to, as you say, a a lower carbon footprint. Can you give us some examples of some of the things that your members have done over the years that have had this benefit and led to this, you know, your feeling that it's 15, 16% of an improvement? Yeah, so the genetics companies have been key. There's been um, some really marked improvements in the number of pigs weaned per sow so the the output from the the sows has really gone up by numbers that even 10 15 years ago people wouldn't have thought they'd ever be able to 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 manage and the second thing was growth rates it's not unusual for people who say i'm getting a, a kilo a day of growth rates and that that was unheard of 15 20 years ago the genetic potential has been pushed up and then we've had a lot of success in reducing the major constraint on achieving that potential which was health problems And that's been done by coordinating farmers to work together. So instead of one farmer popping up and deciding to do a a vaccination program or or something, we do it in groups so that he doesn't go to all the time and expense. And two months later, his neighbours infected him again with, with the same things he had before. By getting people to work together and plan these things together, you get a permanent improvement in the health status within an area. Probably the biggest single improvement we had was the the agreement of the farmers to share their health information which was pivotal because as soon as they're all happy for other farmers and vets to have that information you can then design systems that aren't trying to work in silos and that just enabled us to make some huge bounds that was in 2015 a really pivotal moment for us so as i say up until now it's very much been badged in production efficiencies going forward it, we will shift more towards looking at things explicitly about carbon zero and and heading towards that target. But I suspect the the actions we're doing on farm won't actually be terribly different. Yes, that makes a lot of sense, actually, and and incredibly inspiring, and I probably think quite useful for other sectors, which we we maybe will come on to later. But um, yeah, I mean, Robert mentioned the Scottish government target, which everybody kind of knows about. But when we think more about supply chains... We've spoken to Gary about some of the the his you know whiskey customers and some of the expectations they place. You know we all know the general talk amongst the population and amongst consumers about a desire for for combating climate change. How do you find it within the supply chain, Andy? Where where are some of the demands coming from for you and your members to um, tackle climate change? And how is that impacting upon the way you're looking to the future? In terms of supply chain, the biggest pressure is coming from UK retailers, but they're taking quite a mature approach to it. So what they're not doing is asking people to carbon footprint and then only buying from the people with the lowest carbon footprint so they get bragging rights over their competitors, which is always something that we're nervous about. Certainly up until now, they're they're content. They want people to know what their impact on the environment is. So they want to see the measurement happening, but they're not pushing for the absolute figure. Yes, They yes. just want to know that people are doing it. And that that's far easier for us to, to deal with as a as a supply chain and you know we, we we actively have got involved we we felt the tools for measuring the the carbon footprint on pig farms was was underdeveloped I mean there are just fewer farmers so if you're if you're a carbon footprint tool developer the likes of SRUC your bigger market is with ruminants and arable mm-hmm. farms because there's thousands of them there's only a few yes, hundred pig farms yes. so we always suffer sometimes from being left a little bit behind in a lot of cases, 
tools are saying make the farmer measure you know input all this data and, and collect all when in some cases it's not actually the farmer who's got the best access to that data the, the easiest example being um the source of of protein in the feed supply you know the the early ones on the pig pig carbon footprints ask the farmer to find out from his feed company where the soya came from well How's about we don't bother asking the farmer, we just ask the feed company in the first place <laughs> who have got far better records and much better IT systems to be able to give us that. Yeah, and yeah. it's things like that that we, we can be a lot cleverer about it rather than just, frankly, the lazy option of saying, I'll just get the farmer to fill it in. If we minimise the burden, we'll get far greater uptake of the mm. initiative. Now, interesting, because you, you, know, you said there, Andy, that you, you feel sometimes a bit left behind and, and I totally understand that and, and I'm, I'm glad you've been able to get this grant but actually it sounds to me as though you're not left behind you're kind of sort of forging a path really and setting some really strong examples Robert would you say that's the case do you think do you think other sectors can learn from the pig sector or do you think that they're, they're too different and the challenges are too too far apart. Yeah, no, I, I think Andy's touched on the air about the efficiency gains. They have made fantastic, frankly. But co-ops are really lean by nature. It's part of just the, the low margins that are in, you know, agriculture can be quite tough. But also to drive value back down to the farmer, it means we're really lean. So we are approaching efficiency from the, the economic angle or, or, or from making life easier for the for the producer. But actually, if we look at life through a different lens and look at that as, as um, you know, the, the environmental gains and efficiencies that have been made, putting a different light on the subject, you realise, oh, well, we've, we're not starting at zero. You know, we've done lots already and we should celebrate that. And that's really quite important for, for me, for, for everybody to get their heads around, you know, how do we how to approach the next step? Well, actually, we're, on the, we're making these steps already. It's not a big, a big wall of challenge that's in front of us. We're, we're on this journey. I think... Collaboration within the supply chain or any given supply chain, you know, so we work very closely with a lot of maltsters and also have close links to a lot of distilleries. I feel they could be a lot closer. There could be projects that we work on together, looking at the whole supply chain rather than just our own little bubbles and try and find not just carbon savings, but monetary savings for everybody uh, there as well. You know, Highland Grain back in 2008, I think it was, installed what we call our barley burners so grain up and down the country is dried using fossil fuels diesels burnt through the dryers to get the the product down to a moisture that's safe to to market and store and the way that our barley burners work is that we take a waste product which is the barley screenings which would historically be sold onto the feed market we save that and carry it forward a year and then burn it in these modified burners to dry the new crop the following year and that really that works amazingly well. Looking back through the figures, pre barley burner, we were burning 550, 600,000 litres of diesel throughout harvest, and that number is less than half of that now. So you know there's a huge saving for us there, monetary, but a massive carbon saving. The only other waste product we've got on site really is the, the really fine dust that we take out of the product, take out of the barley on intake and also on on outloading. Highland Grains tried so many things over the years from compost, worm farm, returning to farm to try and deal with this dust. Uh, Laterally, we've been looking at a project to pelletise the dust and then we can use the pellets in through our barley burners. So we're then not putting... So at the minute, the dust is at a cost ourselves, um, tracked off-site all the way down to a recycling centre in Aberdeen, believe it or not. If we were able to do this pellet plant, and return the pellets into the burner, you know, we're releasing the barley back to the market, to the feed market, so there's that money stream coming back to Highland Grain, and also we're reducing the carbon in the lorries trucking up and down the road with this barley dust. So it, you know, on paper it sounds all fantastic, but again, one of the major hurdles is, is the cost involved. It sounds that, you know, you've, you've got you've got the innovation there, you've got the ideas there, you've got a presumably, and we'll come on to this in a minute, but presumably you've got the buy-in of your members. But what is it about these things that, that have made you drive them forward? Why is it that Highland Grain is, is continuing to investigate these new ideas and new innovations? I think at the time it was, the focus was on saving money. So they, they, they looked at ways of reducing the, the fuel bill 
and the machines that they installed, they were actually designed for drying rice and then modified to dry barley, and they've been working great ever since. So I think that back then in 2008, the focus was purely monetary. Um, with us now looking at what other waste products Highland Grain puts out, yes, we're looking at it from a top-end saving, but with one eye on the carbon. And, you know, you made the analogy there that it's carrot-driven, not stick-driven, which is correct. But I think the the stick is still to come. I think as the focus on carbon filters down through some of these large distilleries, I'm hoping that that stick uh, isn't a big one um, and that it's shared by everybody. But that's why I think the collaboration is important. And actually, speaking to a couple of our distiller friends, local distillers, they're already starting to look at catchment area for the barley, the, the miles that the barley travels, where it goes to get malted. They are starting to look at this thing. But again, the cogs turn slowly. You know, in the barley business, it's our test and adjust period is 12 months. You know, we only get one harvest each year. If we want to try something different and it needs tweaked, it's another 12 months before we get to test those tweaks. And, you know, so it's, it's a slow moving machine. It's all about driving profitability. And some of the, the climate change benefits are, are then incidental to that. Some of them are driven by that. But ultimately, if you've got that profitability, you can keep investing. So, Andy, this, this question may have an obvious answer, it may not. How have you found in terms of, of buy-in from your members? Presumably, if something is going to make them more efficient and more profitable, they're going to buy into it anyway. But are they now starting to actually understand the climate change motivation as well as the profitability motivation? Yeah, I would say we, have, we haven't had much complaint from members about the the general subject area or, or, you know, there hasn't been people going, oh, it's it's a load of rubbish, what are we getting into this for? The main resistance comes when we come up with a really clumsy and bureaucratic way of <laughs> asking them to do something. <laughs> yeah. Quite understandably, people go, oh, I, I can't, I don't have time to spend a day filling in this, filling a four-letter word. <laughs> um, and that's really focused me on how can we, the information exists, the will is there to provide it, we just need to come up with with canny ways of getting it. And I think that will overcome a huge amount of resistance. That's not just for, for pigs, that's for everyone. We're asking a lot of farmers to understand the language, which is unfamiliar to most of us. It's quite new. And then also dig out records from three years ago and pick out bits and fill this in and go online and, and upload this, that and the other. It's putting a lot on them. And I think there's a great role for the co-ops in doing that on the, on the sector's behalf. That's very much the, the approach that we're we're taking to it. I guess it's simple, really, isn't it? You're asking them for greater efficiencies, and in return, they're just asking you for a greater, a greater efficient system Absolutely. through which to manage it's, it. So it's you know it's kind of particularly when some of the information we're asking them for second hand information when there's actually it's been through another company in the, on the way. So I, I mean, going forward, uh, the the key part. For us, we think the on-farm and the supply chain side is quite well covered. We, we're, we're concentrating on the, the government policy side. Um, we set up about three years ago an industry strategy to coordinate really across the piece, marketing efforts, health improvements, supply chain integration, all these kind of things. And um, we recently met up with the Cabinet Secretary and volunteered the group that, that oversees that would prepare a similar report for the pig sector as the suckler beef one that was completed by led by Jim Walker. Oh yes, um, yeah. And he's announced an arable group, Andrew Moore is mm. chairing up as well. Yeah. So there, there, so there is a big one that um, that is doing a similar task of going through and saying, well, what policy measures do we feel would help the pig industry to move more quickly towards a, a path to net zero? The carbon footprint of pig meat is about six times lower than some other meats already. So we're starting from a, a pretty good place, but we do have a couple of areas where protein source is one in particular where it's going to need a greater effort than an individual farmer can do. There's bits of research, there's elements of planning where there's a bit of a bias against more intensive agriculture being built, but you can't disinfect wood. So if you've got an old farm that's got health problems on it, you're wasting your time trying to power wash a wooden gate what you need is investment in new facilities, which people are willing to do, but only if the planners will let them put the building up. So there's, there's a lot of these things that are not about money, but they, they are things that are within the, the public sector more widely's 
control. When it comes to efficiencies within the pig supply chain, how far can we go making these changes that will positively impact climate change? And what, what do we do if, if that efficiency starts to slow down? Because we're still going to have the climate change emergency on our hands. I think there's plenty of things for us still to do. I'm not concerned of us running out of target areas that can continue to, to push the, the efficiency further. The largest part of the, the footprint of, of pig meat is is on farm. So we talked a good bit about that. But there, there is scope for improvement through the rest of the supply chain uh, transport. In particular, pigs are, are quite large animals. There's things we can do, particularly um, that with the, the Scottish avatar, we're trying very hard on the integrating the, the scheduling systems between the farms and so on. So there's some of these, there the linkages between the different businesses in a supply chain, there's still a lot of scope for, for making that better. And in the process, you've you've less journeys or, or fuller lorries going places or shorter running periods in factories because all of the pigs are arriving at the right time, less downtime, less less breakdowns, all these kind of things. And and likewise, as you go on through the, the further processing, um, the, there's a lot of scope for making this better still. So yeah, there'll be plenty to keep me busy for another few years. Yeah, I was going to say, you've got your work cut out for a while then. <laughs> Robert, what are your thoughts on that? What did you pick up anything within your research and surveying about, you know, what's next and, and even perhaps a potential fear that, that efficiencies might start to slow down, or is that not, not something people are worried about? Yeah, no, there's a few things. Some of them are quite specific to, to their own sector or their own problem. But I suppose the other thing, just because you can doesn't mean to say you should. Some of the <laughs> the price points for some of this just now is pretty price prohibitive. But at some point, these points are going to lower and it's going to become more interesting. And, and we're all time poor, but yet, but yet we want to do more. And it's not just climate change. We want you know, more public services, more public goods in one form or another, which is not all about carbon. So there's a whole heap of stuff that we've got to try and balance while still trying to make a business out of it. You know, we've still got to, got to make it work financially. So throughout our membership, there's a huge range of business models, you know, from the, the small farmer that does just you know grow some barley some for feed some for malting to feed or you know they've also cattle sheep all the way up to large contract farmers who have several large farms and put a sizable tonnage through us they all have different opinions on what Highland Green should be doing most of those opinions um, are based on profitability but you know there's quite a few members who are starting to look at their own business models from a carbon aspect getting carbon audits done on farm Uh, so it's you know, the the ball is rolling on it. And as you say, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. In fact, Gary, you've been very good at predicting my questions before they come, which has been very helpful. Thank you. But um I think I think the big thing here for me is is what you said about we know at the moment to a degree we're we're driven by the carrot, but everybody knows that the stick is coming and in life, whatever that stick is for the more you're prepared for it, the better you will fare when it starts to chase you. Being prepared is half the battle. Having some ideas up your sleeve, plans in place, ready to hit the big red button and moving those plans. You know, going back to the pellet idea, I mean, it was initially driven by the fact that it was it was a cost to Highland Grain. When we lost the, the deal with the farmer to return the dust to the farm, it then became, oh, well, this is going to cost us. And the pellet idea came up. You know, but going back to the, the carbon thing, we, as a, as a group, as a board of directors, we've discussed quite a few different options and some of them are, you know, looking at different ways to dry barley. You know, the technology is out there to change things slightly. But again, these things come at a, a sizable cost. And when we're in a, a supply chain, a market that hasn't moved in, in such a long time uh, price-wise, you know, some farmers will tell you that the, the price of barley this year was the same as they were getting in 1980. You know, margins are tight, so to enter into large capital expenditure projects, it's not as easy as just saying, yeah, there's a carbon saving there, let's do it. It, you know, it needs to be a long time coming, really. But as I said earlier, the big stick is coming. I hope that when the pressure is put on the, the larger companies within the supply chain, that they actually look to the suppliers like yourselves and the farmers and try and work together and find ways to keep the barley local, keep it malted local. Why ship it in from Europe? Okay, it might be a couple of quid cheaper. 
but they need to start looking at the, the carbon aspect of the, of the supply as well. I think just now people are tired. We're running harder and harder and everybody's banging the drum about you must be more efficient, you must be this, you must be that. But nobody's providing solutions that help them. Particularly, you know, everybody's going to sell them something to, to make them be more efficient. You know, but, but, but does it? And, and equally, they're getting the news that all of a sudden they've been doing what they've been doing for generations and all of a sudden they are now the source of all climate evil. And you're working away, you're bursting a gut for 100 hours a week and, and then you think, what, what, what on earth? You know, um, they're getting, getting these things and, and policies going in envi- environment and, thing, and you know, nobody seems to be valuing what they're doing and what they've been conditioned to do because they've been, in, 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 they've been required, they've stepped up to the plate and they've been required to produce food and produce food really efficiently and, and really cheaply. When you keep getting bar- bombarded by uh, requests for your land to be doing additional things, whilst nobody's also addressing the fact that, yeah, but you also want cheap food and you also want it to come from the UK, you want provenance and, and you want added value, you want quality assurance, you want reassurance. And you can see why quite quickly farmers become quite despondent and then all of a sudden the shutters come down. You know, you can see how that happens. You 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 you, you, you get so far and you think, I this is way too much, I can't do. So all I'm going to do is just do my thing and <laughs> you end up being quite cynical about everything else. Uh, so yeah, they kind of might appreciate it, they might understand it, but really, you know, they're, they're, they're working really hard as it is. So the purpose of a co-op, we, we, we've talked about driving value back to farmers. And often when you talk about value, you talk about money. And, and yeah, they're clearly going to be in business. But, but value is more than that. It's about making life easier as a provision of a service that you can't just do yourself. You know, there's the marketing piece that you know, Andy and Gary can do for you. There's access of markets you can't do individually. You know, there's value gain there financially, but also that service is, you know, second to none. Because we, we can look at these things, um, you know, if a processor said, look, you know, we're getting pressure from retailers, we want to be able to do this, we want to be able to be seen to be doing this as well. And, and if it's a more grown-up two-way conversation with a group, with a co-op, you can do that, but you can't do that with individual farmers. You end up just getting things imposed on you. Yeah, spot on, Robert. And in fact, you, you, know, you brought to mind an episode that we did or probably about four weeks ago now with SAOS board member, actually, Rory Christie. It caused quite a stir, that episode, but in a very positive way. So if anybody listening to this episode has not heard the dulcet tones of Rory Christie on a podcast, go back and listen because he talks about a lot of what you've just covered and it's quite hard hitting. Going back to climate change, gentlemen, and I'm not going to keep you for too much longer. um, I'd just like to get your thoughts on this. Hopefully we won't be resorting to Zoom calls forevermore and hopefully we'll be meeting up face to face. So imagine for a moment that we meet up face to face in five years from now to record another podcast about climate change. I'll maybe start with you, Andy. What will we be saying, do you think? What will you be telling me in five years' time that's different to what we've discussed today? I would say we'll have a we'll have an immediate answer on the the carbon emissions of the whole supply chain, the individual farms. People will understand what the bigger contributors on their farm are, are, is, and they'll be doing something about it. We will have found alternative protein sources for the pig industry, which will have made a step change reduction in the the carbon impact of Scottish pig meat. We'll be selling more pig meat at a lower net carbon footprint than we have today and hopefully we'll it will be coming from some thriving profitable farms so there's reason for optimism absolutely thank you robert yeah i think i think well, I, I hope we'll be looking back on this and thank goodness you know was, was that our starting point i think you know no individual uh, was responsible for climate change but yet we all are and i think there'll be a general acceptance of of that and uh, from a co-op point of view, I think the, the what we're doing just now through the Co-op and Climate Challenge project, I think if we see an action plan starting to refine itself out of the different things that the co-ops would like to do in the future, and that ends up getting hardwired into the business. And it's only once you do that, you implement real change because it's, it's part of the business, which kind of sits nicely within the co-op ethos. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that's, you know, more than, more than achievable. Not just, you know, not just co-ops, but all businesses need to start shouting from the rooftops. The 2045 target is not far away. And if the years keep flying by like they have been doing, that date's going to be upon us in no time. And it's it's no small task 
you know, we're trying to reverse in 25 years what we, we spent 100 years ruining. It's going to take a lot of time, effort, money, focus. And I think it's not just businesses that need to change their, their way of thinking. It's the consumer as well. You know, they, they need to be willing to pay an extra couple of pence on the, on the pint of milk, an extra couple of pence on the pack of bacon. They need to accept the fact that if they want Scottish whiskey from Scottish barley malted in Scotland with low miles, that they, they need to be willing to pay a little, a little bit extra for it. And only once everybody in the supply chain, from the buyer all the way through to the, the grower, is involved. It's the only way we're going to make any decent changes, I fear. Gary, you, again, I said I'm inspired when I speak to people like you because you are optimistic and you're upbeat, but you have identified a problem. As you said, we've got 25 years to undo something that collectively we took 100 years to to ruin. You operate in an industry whereby you've got a 12-month sort of testing period. So you have 25 of those periods left to fix things uh, how do you maintain your optimism in that what is it that's driving that optimism <laughs> i think until this interview i haven't really thought about it much myself about the 25 test and adjust periods <laughs> so um yeah that's made my day to be honest um <laughs> it does put it in context so doesn't it it's not far away it can't be one of these things that we leave to the night before you know it's not like homework where you, you, you just leave it till the 11 o'clock on the evening before it needs to be handed in it needs to be started now I mean I I really do hope that we get the the big players I mean I can only talk for my own supply chain but I really do hope that we get the big players you know the the large branded distilleries really getting on board with this because they're the ones that drive this supply chain and without input from the top end then I'm afraid we're up against it you know we'll never hit this this target and do you have optimism that they are up for the job or up to the job, I should say, both. Yes, yeah, I do actually. As much as these are big companies, a lot of the time it does come down to one or two individuals to really push these things forward. And I think the industry's got these people. They just need to be poked and prodded until they they start doing the right thing at the right time. Uh, so no, I mean, I'm quietly confident that there's a lot we can do as an industry. Uh, there's a lot we can do together as an industry. I just hope that it, it starts to transpire soon. Yes, I, I think you're right. The, the, the task is daunting, but actually the more I speak to people in the sector, you know, we've spoken to Martin Kennedy, we've spoken to, to Nigel Miller and the, the Farming for 1.5 group, the more people I speak to, the more upbeat I feel about about meeting that challenge. And that's not to say it's complacency, but the, yeah, it's, it's a mountain to climb. But I think there are plenty of good people out there doing good things together that uh, we will get there. No, I agree totally. Yeah, really appreciate your time. And I look forward to speaking to you again in five years, if not before. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Us too. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks. Thanks so much to SAOS and to Gary Catto, Andy McGowan and Robert Logan. We'll be back with more from SAOS on farming and climate change in coming weeks. And we'll be talking about things such as livestock breeding, plant breeding, challenges we face, how we're going to address them. And of course... The big elephant in the room as far as climate change is concerned, the weather. So look out for forthcoming episodes. Meantime, that's it from me and we'll see you next week.